panel coming up here. We had uh, uh, some of the folks on the panel here uh, approached us last year after hearing some of the public safety things we had on, on there and, and uh, uh, voluntarily kind of came up with the panel and the ideas and, and things for this because of, of what they do and the importance to the maritime industry in California. So uh, thank, you for, thank you for doing that. And let me uh, go ahead and introduce Captain Jenkins. Captain Jenkins assumed his duties as sector commander and captain of the port for the U.S. Coast Guard sector LA Long Beach in May of 2012. From command offices on Terminal Island in San Pedro, the sector coordinates operations in an area of responsibility stretching more than 350 miles along the California coast and out of course 200 miles offshore and including the nation's largest port complex, that being LA Long Beach. Ashore, Captain Jenkins has served in a variety of financial management and management budget positions including a tour at the Department of Homeland Security. Captain Jenkins earned a Bachelor of Science in Math Science from Clemson University, a Master of Science in Management from the Naval Postgraduate School, and a Master of Strategic Studies from the U.S. Army War College. Let's welcome Captain Jenkins. All right, thanks, David. And it's great to be with you today to uh, talk to you about Marine Public Safety Response. The panel members we have here today in brief are Mr. John Aubro, who's a Coast Guard civilian employee on my staff, uh, Battalion Chief Stephen Raganold from the Long Beach Fire Department, and Mr. Richard Brada from the Port of Long Beach. We, uh, we did have four panel members, we're down to three, and with that I took the opportunity to uh, to put in a couple slides as the introduction to this to, to round out the presentation. So I'm going to lead with that and then introduce our first panel member. So I had three points I wanted to make in an introduction to this topic, and they are that maritime safety, maritime security, and maritime response are all a team effort. And I think we're going to emphasize that throughout this panel presentation, that that in Los Angeles, Long Beach, we, we really strive to get that full team together to manage safety, security, and response. It takes, uh, it takes a broad consortium of partners working together, and a, a list of them is up on the screen. Of course, not all inclusive, but an example of the wide array of people we try to bring together to, uh, to get the right ideas for safety and security and response, to uh, incorporate capability, incorporate equipment, incorporate uh, people, incorporate knowledge, and then to build the plans, uh, put the preparations in place so that we're ready to respond in unison. Of course, that's not unique to Los Angeles Long Beach. I, I got my uh, um, Port Wyneme, uh partners here as well today, so I wanted to make sure uh, they're always working hard with their uh, local, state, and federal partners, uh, with their private sector partners, and, uh, and um, working conducting their own exercises for safety and security up there as well with the Center for Asymmetric Warfare as, as a lead, lead entity. But um, in Los Angeles Long Beach, which we're going to focus on today, this is a, an example of the groups that come together to, uh, to work and uh, put our plans in place. So it's a team effort, and, uh, and the Coast Guard has some unique authorities that contribute to that team effort. Uh, a list of those is on the board. These are the authorities that the sector commander, my position in the the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach and in Port Wyneme brings to the table. And uh, these are great to leverage those partnerships. They contribute significantly in, in our ability to, uh, to plan for response and then to execute response. And I'm going to focus on a couple of those in particular now. Uh, the first is the cap of the Port Authority. And this authority was actually born out of tragedy, born out of a, a response and uh, a emergency uh, efforts in, um, and, and a recognized need from the government that somebody needed to step up and, and have some significant responsibility in port complexes. In World War I, as uh, munition ships were loaded uh, to carry uh, the war effort overseas, there were some uh, big safety problems and some significant accidents. And in Halifax, Nova Scotia in 1917, the uh, French vessel, the Mont Blanc, loaded with explosives, collided with another vessel, uh, caught fire, and then exploded. It was a huge explosion, uh, actually uh, 2,000, approximately 2,000 dead, two square kilometers leveled of that uh, port city. 
And with that devastating tragedy, the U.S. government recognized that they needed somebody to take uh, charge of this safety issue in our ports. And they named the senior Coast Guard official in the Port of New York as the captain of the port. And with that authority, uh, started to get our hands around that safety problem. And th that authority has grown uh, since then with Ports and Waterways Safety Act, other, other uh, legislation. We don't like to think of it as a 900-pound gorilla, so Mr. Nixon, but we, we try not to do that. Uh, we, we know it's a very powerful authority, as some of our other authorities are as well, and we try, so we try to use uh, prudence as we exercise those authorities, but with the Captain of the Port Authority, we, we're able to uh, establish safety and security zones, to direct uh, ships that, if we deem them a safety or security issue, to direct their movements and control them until we feel uh, that they're safe to proceed. Uh, the same thing with waterfront facilities. So it is a pretty significant authority. Just another example of, uh, of why we need the safety and security authorities, and to bring it a little more close to home, uh, in, both in terms of date and, uh, and location, the uh, vessel SS Sansonina in 1976 exploded in the port of Los Angeles. Uh, not munitions, of course, this was a, a tank vessel that had offloaded its cargo, had a buildup of fumes on deck, and, uh, and subsequently exploded with the loss of six lives, uh, some 50 injured, um, and, and a shutdown of, of that part of the port complex for, for uh, week, weeks. Um, and so with that, uh, again, the reason to put this in, other than it being, a, as I said, a, a local incident and a, and a pretty cool picture, is to, um, to emphasize that it's a team effort, that these, uh, these authorities are, are significant, and in addition, that some, the legislation that we need to put in place sometimes is very important. The, uh, the regulations that we need to put in place to manage uh, increasing risk, be it uh, munitions in the port, be it uh, a, a buildup of vapor. And in this case, it was inert gas systems that came into regulation after that. But as we look at bigger and bigger ships coming into the port, more automation, uh, new propulsion systems, LNG was discussed. These all carry some additional uh, risk and hazard with them, and uh, we need to work as a team to figure out the way to manage those risks. A couple of more slides just to uh, talk about specific partnerships, and, and th this is to wrap up this team concept and to, to say that what we're doing is putting protocols and, uh, and plans in place through various forums, and we, so we're, we're we have that in place. It's not something new. It's been going on for years uh, in the pollution response area with our area committee, uh, search and rescue councils, uh, regula regulatory enforcement and joint operations that we conduct day in and day out with law enforcement, with, uh, with response agencies. Uh, a relatively new threat, the Ponga boat smuggling, we've put additional coordinating mechanisms in place to manage that with our law enforcement partners. And common to all of these is, uh, is incident command system. That's been mentioned several times, but the incident command system is key to us coming together, being able to work to plan operations, both pre-planned operations and to respond to emergent incidences. And finally, uh, this is my last slide, just to uh, highlight one particular forum that has been very successful is our Area Maritime Security Committee. This was a post-9-11 uh, committee that was stood up with the uh, title of the Federal Maritime Security Coordinator that came to the captain of the port. This body initially was tasked to write a security plan, to exercise that plan, and, uh, and develop risk-based uh, decision-making processes in the port. It did that, but it's been so successful. In Los Angeles, Long Beach, we have a great group of people, uh, the right level of people, uh, the right uh, group representation, again, from labor, from private sector, different aspects of uh, shipping agencies, uh, uh, um, bulk liquid, um, a passenger vessel, and then, and then the full range of response entities from local, state, and federal responders all come together to, uh, to work. And with that, we've, uh, it's kind of gone beyond just uh, a terrorism focus, just a security focus. And, uh, and with that, I'm going to bring up our first speaker, uh, Mr. John Arbor, who's going to elaborate on some of the area maritime security specific initiatives that we've had. 
So Mr. John Arborough, as I said, is a, a currently a civilian employee for the U.S. Coast Guard. He's a port security specialist by title. He has 14 years active duty uh, prior to coming in as a, coming on as a civilian and rose to the rank of chief petty officer. As a port security specialist for over three years, he's developed plans for maritime transportation system recovery, for marine firefighting and salvage, and for radiological and nuclear detection. And he also serves as a marine transportation recovery specialist for the Coast Guard's deployable Pacific Area Incident Management Team. Mr. Albor. Thank you, Captain. Good afternoon. This afternoon, I'm going to talk about some of the partnerships and collaboration the Coast Guard is fortunate to be part of in the ports of Los Angeles, Long Beach, and Port Wyneme. Outline some of the contingency plans that have been developed through these partnerships and highlight two best practices we think can be models for other port complexes. As Captain Jenkins mentioned, the Coast Guard has a lot of different responsibilities and authorities uh, through different federal statutes. These responsibilities and authorities can basically be distilled down to three different roles. Most of us in this room know us as a regulator for safety and security. Also as a first responder for, for security incidents, for oil spills, for mariners in distress. And as a port partner, working with other agencies, and working with industry to make sure our waterways are, remain open for commerce and for pleasure. Some of the different partnerships that we have through the different committees, as Cap mentioned, the Area Maritime Security Committee. This has been pretty much forefront for the last 10 years as a, as a coordinating mechanism in the ports. But it's not a new concept. If you look back into the, the mid-80s, the Port Readiness Committees, those were a development between Department of Defense and Department of Transportation to come together. How do, they, how do you manage the in, military industrial complex and trying to outload that onto vessels, send, uh, send munitions, other warfighting efforts overseas. So port readiness committees were developed in over a dozen different ports, including the Port of Long Beach, to coordinate some of the training that goes into before military loadout happens, and then once the loadout does happen for either Desert Storm, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, OEF, how to coordinate that mechanism once it does take place. Other committees, the Area Committee came out after the Open 90, Exxon Valdez incident, also the American Trader incident. These came into captain port zones to have committees, coordinating committees, to look at how do we respond to oil spills, how do we prevent oil spills, what's the best mechanism for coordinating those efforts. There was a big impetus in Los Angeles, Long Beach, because the Exxon Valdez was a frequent visitor to the ports, offloading Alaskan crude. The American Trader incident happened only a few months after Exxon Valdez, and that's spilled over half a million gallons of crude onto Orange County beaches. So there was, it was a big, big uh, impetus in the Los Angeles Long Beach area to have a, a good solid committee to coordinate those type of efforts. Another committee on here, the Harbor Safety Committee, and that was started right here in California. So through California legislation, wanted to have harbor safety committees to talk about how do we coordinate the safe use of waterways. So now this, is, this has grown to nationwide, and I think the last count there's about 85 different committees, organizations throughout the whole U.S. that are focused on safe transportation and safe use of the waterways. Not all these committees are, are run by the Coast Guard. Uh, for, the, for example, the Harbor Safety Committee, Captain John Strong of Jacobson Pilots is the one who who's in charge of this committee, and the Coast Guard happens to be represented in there and fortunate to be part of it. Is this a slide of all the different response agencies that we have in the port complex of Los Angeles, Long Beach? All these different agencies, we work day in, day out, doing response, doing training. The tactics, techniques, procedures developed for response and also the curriculum for the training comes out of these partnerships and comes out of plans that are developed through these partnerships, through these committees. So some of the general coordinating plans that we have in the ports right now, these are for a, a whole variety of different maritime disasters, from oil spills to aircraft disasters, 
to security incidents, transportation disruptions, and also marine casualties. The last two on here, I'm kind of segue into my next, the next two speakers. The Marine Transportation System Recovery Plan that was developed through the Marine Transportation System Recovery Subcommittee, which is a, a division of our, our local Area Maritime Security Committee. And the Marine Firefighting and Salvage Contingency Plan through our local Marine Firefighting Work Group. Now these two groups that I'm about to talk about for our two best practices that we want to push forward, they weren't from le any legislation or any mandate like some of the other stuff we have, but basically born out of there was an identified need to have some sort of coordination group and bring those subject matter experts together to talk about the issues and to hopefully develop some plans. So the first best practice, the Marine Transportation System Recovery Subcommittee. This is co-chaired by a member of the Coast Yard and also Mr. Barada from the Port of Long Beach. So here we have quarterly meetings where we get together and we talk about some of the issues about port recovery. Not just waterways, but the whole marine tra transportation system. From roads, rail, highway, bridges, uh, terminal use, the whole, the whole complex. So this is a little different than what happens typically on the Gulf Coast or East Coast where these groups will get together just for hurricane season. But our big problem out here, our big threat, is earthquakes. And as far as I know, we don't have a season for that yet. But you can see all the different agencies and different entities. This is heavily, heavily populated by industry, because that's who the, the main users are for the port complex. We want their input into these recovery plans, and also how we're going to coordinate together to have a good recovery, a quick recovery. The Marine Transportation System Recovery Subcommittee also forms the basis for what we call the MITSRU, the Marine Transportation System Recovery Unit. And that's basically an incident management structure that provides input to the captain of the port, and the unified command, on what are the, the, the big issues during that disruption and how to recover the port quickly. The second best practice I want to talk about is our Marine Firefighting Work Group. So this helped develop our Marine Firefighting and Salvage Contingency Plan. Once again, we also have quarterly meetings on this, but the focus on this is more public, or more, uh, public agencies instead of the private. So we're talking about response, the coordinating mechanism for talking about grants and training. So there's collaboration on that. It's not just one agency trying to go it alone. Now it's a group. And talking about some of the issues that are coming up as far as like vessel response plans for tank ships and how we're integrating public and private entities for that. How are we integrating the, the large salvage companies into the local responses? So there was, there was an identified need to bring these groups together to talk on a quarterly basis. At least we can put some names of faces and develop those reports before there's an incident that happens. With both of these, there are great opportunities for maintaining that open dialogue and also practicing some of what Kat was talking about with the incident management system. Thank you very much. So Mr. Arbor and I kind of discussed what we're doing to prepare to be ready uh, to respond. And now uh, our next speaker, Battalion Chief uh, Stephen Raganol from Long Beach Fire Department is going to talk a little bit more in depth about the response. Chief Raganol is a 27-year veteran of the Long Beach Fire Department and it is currently assigned to the Port of Long Beach for liaison and fire prevention. His fire career includes specialties in paramedic, urban search and rescue, and hazmat. And he's presently working on a training curriculum for marine, fire mining, fire, sorry, for marine firefighting for land-based firefighters in conjunction with uh, Coastline Community College. Chief Ragonal. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I am one of the practitioners. Uh, I'm the guy that drives around in a red suburban and I'm the first chief officer that shows up at a high rise fire and at an incident. So I'm gonna, this is gonna be colored from a practitioner's perspective and I really count this as an opportunity and a privilege to talk to this group here. And I have to put a couple of disclaimers in initially. Uh, 
this is my conversation. It's been vetted through my management, but it doesn't necessarily represent policy for my fire department. My experience is limited to one agency in Southern California, although I do have some national experience, primarily with urban search and rescue and the Coast Guard on uh, uh, policy development. And I think I can make some general observations on uh, other fire departments. I had to make certain assumptions for this presentation. It, one key one is it's going to be land-based units that respond to this maritime event. Although we do have maritime dedicated resources, they're going to be overwhelmed, overwhelmed very quickly. So the bulk of the responders are going to be land-based units. And I believe I'm talking to uh, my audience today is primarily from the maritime industry. Uh, so not a whole lot of firefighters out there, although I'll have one raise his hand right now. Mike Sargent, he's one of my bosses in the back. So he's going to check me for any lies I may be telling you. He'll catch you later. <laughs> and much of this was prompted by the OPA 90 Vessel Response Plan standards that came out February of, I believe, last year for tankers. It made us start thinking in terms of how we were going to interact with other agencies and, and particularly the privates. So I'm going to be, the three parts of my program, what we have, what I think we bring to the game, what I believe we need, where are some of the gaps, and some recommendations on how we can get to it. Okay, 724. Fire department, call 911, you're always going to get somebody. Uh, we have multiple specialized resources, paramedics, large capacity, fireboats, foam, air, air ops, hazmat, USAR, uh, incident management teams. We are the first responders. And there's another day at the office. This is our bread and butter operation, interior firefighting. Now, I'm not suggesting we would ever need an airdrop on top of a tanker in the port of Long Beach, but if in case you happen to do need one, the fire service is where you would get it from. This is a normal amount of, uh, this is a, a typical capability we could bring to the table. And just a moulage of the various kind of operations, again, the bread and butter, house fire, airport, uh, the auto extrication, and the bottom right picture there is all the white hats getting together and stumbling over a problem. And if you're not familiar with ICS, that's what we would call an IMT, an in incident management team. We also bring a strong integration with the county EMS system, emergency medical systems, the trauma, the public health, the disaster management. We also have a, a well-vetted integration with the privates in the petroleum industry with what we call SCHEMO. Uh, the refineries and the tank farms and all that. They're fire brigades. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're able to field and sustain a complex organization quickly. Most of this is wildland based since the 1970s, well institutionalized mutual aid. And if you have a background in ICS and know the acronym NIMS, and you have just a slight prejudice toward California, you will know that FireScope, a California organization, led and continues to lead NIMS. So this is well vetted within our institution. And again, another bad day at the office. What resources do I need? You know, what, what kind of, how am I going to manage this catastrophe? This is what we practice on. This is what we count our business. The map on the side is one year with a whole bunch of fires. Each one of those little flames, excuse me again, <coughs> is a major incident, each one with a complex organization supporting it. So an awful lot of resources, and I'm not uh, advertising for in and out burgers. What I am suggesting, though, is each one of those incidents has a very complex support logistics network also. So we need to feed and clothe and take care of that, that large ad hoc organization. We also bring to the table a well-oiled emergency decision-making process. We practice this every day. Now, this is going to get into a little bit of the psycho babble, but we have two primary means that we make decisions. One is recognition prime decision making, uh, where I essentially I paint a picture of what needs to happen and I kind of fill in the gaps. The other one is called an OODA loop, and if you're not familiar with that, I think I have a picture here, yeah, kind of a complex busy diagram over there. Uh, it, again, well vetted, particularly in the military. Although we may not use the term OODA loop in our decision making, frankly, our good decision makers, this is what they follow. Now, why am I bringing this up, again, the psycho babble, is that we bring this to the table. We may not necessarily understand it academically, but we do bring this. But they have a common weakness, and the common weakness is we now have to take that 
wild land or land-based knowledge, that context, and take it to this very weird environment, the maritime. And this is where some of the gaps occur. Uh, oh, one other thing that we do bring to the, to the table, and it's going to lead to my partner, uh, Rich's uh, 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 talk, is this concept of business continuity. Our term for salvage means something different in the maritime industry. We go in, go put the house fire out, and look for the family pictures. When we go to that commercial building, we're trained and geared up to put the fire out in the office first so the business can open up again. Again, this is just what we think about, just what we bring to the table. Okay, here are the gaps. Another acronym, Unified Command. I go and manage that high-rise fire. I am the IC. That's my gig. Can't work that way in a, in a maritime environment. It has to be a unified command. This is stated by statute and just by practicality. There's too many vetted in individuals. We have an a, a mechanism in place. It's called Unified Command. Uh, we're used to establishing those unified commands. However, we only talk to our brothers within the fire service. It's odd for us to bring in other agencies to establish this UC. And that last little statement over there, this would be a bad day in the maritime environment, is where you have that first in captain or first in chief officer saying, what are you doing at my command post? This is my fire. Now, I'm not suggesting that's going to happen all the time, but I think we need to spend a little more time and effort on training guys away from that. Again, it's a collaborative effort. I think it would be a very interesting exercise to have put a working group together to develop a good definition of a collaboration. I think it would be good for all, all parties in, involved. We make tactical comparisons to high rise and air, uh, confined space and other typical events. Sometimes they transfer over to the maritime environment, other times not. They're like our false friends. Some of the words we use will be parallel to a high-rise fire, but they really are a different, ta different skill and a different uh, knowledge base. Forcible entry and ventilation are two of the terms. We're not bringing much understanding or knowledge of ship systems and stability issues. I can pour an awful lot of water on a high-rise, and it's not going to roll over and sink. Okay? Ships are not quite the same way. This is one of my frustrations, too, is that our, my local fire agency, uh, Los Angeles or Long Beach, have little control over fire prevention measures on board the ship. This is a Coast Guard gig. We don't know or trust ship systems. Some of our tactics would suggest that we would bring our own water. In other words, from the hydrant to the pumper to the hose up the side of the ship to the distribution hose and the nozzle, all ours not an efficient system. It's because we don't necessarily trust the ship systems. We clearly also have some language and cultural differences with the crew. We don't understand that when we cross the gangway, that's a foreign country. When I go to the house fire, when I go to the high-rise fire, that's mine. I own it. It is not the same on board the ship. We have to understand and train for that also. We also have little understanding or appreciation presently that our best initial actions is not necessarily to take over the fire, but to augment what the ship crew is doing already. One of the things I've gained in my uh, uh, learning about this skill and this industry is you talk to the folks on a Coast Guard cutter or on a very large oil uh, uh, transport vessel, they're all very proud of their firefighting capabilities. So to have that first-in captain or first-in chief officer assume it is his fire, yeah, maybe a little counterproductive. They should enter into that dilemma with the idea they are augmenting ongoing uh, fire, prevent, uh, fire control measures. Our understanding, FIRE's understanding of ICS is going to be different and arguably even the Coast Guard and certainly in the commercial or industrial. Much more organic, much more dynamic. Each org chart only represents one slice in time. Look at the lectures that you may have gone to on ICS. They have this beautiful stereotypical org chart. That's just one little snapshot. And to fall back on uh, jargon, um, I need to get an IMT at a, my Mac. Again, these are words and concepts that are not relatively well known outside of my industry. 
Okay, those are the weak points. I think there are some ways around it. We've exercised and developed some of it. This is a somewhat dated uh, presentation. Uh, so we've actually gotten some resolution on it. There are NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, standards, personal qualifications for firefighting from land-based units in a maritime environment. It's a good standard. <clears throat> it's not perfect, but it's uh, what we have to work with. So we have two local efforts. Long Beach is focusing on a remote learning application web-based through a local community college. It's going to be about two and a half hours in length, 16 units or 16 uh, uh, sections, and it is going to be compliant to 1405 and 1005. Most importantly about that, because it is remote learning, is now I'm not teaching in increments of 30 or 40, I'm teaching in increments of 800. That's what the initial contract calls for. Uh, we, uh, Mr. Slaughter talked about it earlier, Cal EMA with Cal Fire and Cal Maritime. They have their own projects uh, working, um, and I think that we have a pretty good correlation between our, our agencies and with uh, Cal Maritime and Cal EMA. Uh, we're not brand new to this either in that we have looked at the maritime environment before. We have some fairly mature ICS and some organizational things and some previous training. That's one very complex ICS uh, org chart. I'm just putting it up there uh, just to give you an idea that it has been looked at before. Here's a ver another variation of it. It's not a brand new area to us, but I, again, I think there are some areas of improvement. Uh, we, I also recommend that we have this continued engagement with the U.S. Coast Guard. My relationship with them, I think, is great, and with L.A. City also, very, very positive. The Marine Firefighting uh, Salvage and Contingency Plan, it's been around in the, in the L.A. area, Long Beach area, for about two years now, I would say, and we need to practice that plan. One key area of weakness is we need to better integrate with the privates. If you're familiar with the vessel response plans, they are obligated to have their own salvage and firefighting. I don't think we've exercised that well enough, but again, this is one of the areas I think we've made some fairly positive integration over the last uh, couple of months. I think if we just start off having tabletops and lead to green cells and maybe even functional exercises, all would be benefit to it. We need a better notification plan if there's a distress signal on channel 16, the, the marine uh, uh, channel. Boy, you may have dozens of units responding to it. I think we can do better and there's a model available. It's called a leak wheel. Rather than a linear notification process called A, B, C, D, the folks on that inner wheel are all obligated to talk to each other. And essentially what you're beginning to do now is set up that MAC. And I'll talk about MACs in a minute or so. Uh, but it's a much better notification system, and we've made some inroads on developing that also. The top one there, um, if I go to my city attorney, who is my counsel, and I ask them about maritime issues, they'll tell me everything I need to know about contract law, not admiralty law. And if I go to the admiralty law specialist, say, yeah, I'd love to talk to you, and this is no kidding, but I'm already retained by this other guy. So it really is kind of a stumbling block out there. When we try to integrate with the privates, they would like to have us develop a consent agreement between us, the municipals, and the private agencies. Well, this is all new to this. They depend on the city attorney to suss this out and also go to an admiralty law specialist that is working for someone else is not, it's not helpful. So we need objective legal counsel on this, and I'm actually hoping that an academic environment might be able to provide the municipals at some kind of resource. I think we can also do a better job at pre-establishing the non-operational elements of ICS, particularly finance and logistics. We would do that no problem on a wild land, but when we start talking about reimbursement, a financial reimbursement for a maritime event, it gets much more complex, and the logistics demands on a, a maritime incident is going to get much more uh, uh, complex. Max, if I have NIMS up here, National Incident Management System, and over here on one side I have ICS, over here I have this parallel system called multi agent Coordination System. It is a command level officer with the authority to allocate resources. They're the policy people, they're the support people. They are, again, parallel and supportive to that incident management. 
We have a finite number of stakeholders within the LA Long Beach port complex. I tend to believe we can pre-establish some of that support network so if in case we do have that incident, that support mechanism is already in place. And there is the definition of a MAC. It, it comes right out of the ICS uh, uh, books. Multiple agencies, large scale incidents and emergencies. And if you need a better description of it, this graphic, in uh, ICS I would have the incident commander and then I'd have liaison, uh, agency liaison. And if it gets real big, I'll turn that agency liaison into a MAC. So it's a progression from agency liaison. And that's a close. We have very different uh, cultures between the municipals, firefighting and the salvage industry, and the maritime industry, but I believe there are some parallels that actually even go beyond the double-breasted jacket. And this is a quote out of the uh, U.S. Navy Salvage Handbook, and I'll leave you to read that for yourself. Um, I think uh, that the fire service is very much in similar to this. And uh, thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Chief. Our final <laughs> panel member is uh, Mr. Richard Barada from the Port of Long Beach. And so we, we talked about pre-event planning, uh, preparedness, the event, the response, and now we're going to talk about uh, recovery. And so uh, um, Mr. Barada is the Director of Risk Management and has worked for the Port of Long Beach since 2006. But he's been in the industry of risk management and insurance since 1973. His current responsibilities include managing risk associated with all of the port's activities, including employee safety and construction operations. He's also the program manager for the port's business continuity and chairperson for the California Association of Port Authorities Insurance Purchasing Group. Mr. Barada. This one here. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. How many of you ever heard the words business continuity before? Raise your hands. I knew you would. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about what happens after life safety and property preservation units leave. When the fire department leaves, when the police department goes, when the ashes are cooling and the smoke is clearing, what do you do with your business? What happens then? We're going to talk today a little bit about what one port, the Port of Long Beach, believes is the role of a port authority following a disaster. Let's talk a little bit about that. Today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the port's incident management team organizational structure. You've heard those words before. You're going to hear them from me again today. We're going to review communication flow following an incident. And hopefully by the time we're done with this, you'll have a little finer, more fine appreciation about what the Port Authority's role is in recovering its business. A little bit about the Port of Long Beach for you. 32,000 acres, we moved over 6 million TEUs, tonnage equivalent units, in 2012, represents 75 million metric tons of cargo, and we are a designated FEMA staging area for disaster relief. And because of that last point, it behooves us to make sure that our port is operational following a disaster. Now, in order to accomplish this, we looked at, all right, what do we do after the smoke clears? What can we do? What do we do as a port authority to try to make sure that we can continue to operate? So what we did is we looked at a, the idea of putting together a business continuity plan. And its purpose is pretty simple increase port resiliency, support the continuation of port operations, avoid a cargo diversion, make, maintain stakeholder confidence, and promote a stable operating environment, among other things. Now, when I talk about stakeholders, we got a lot of them. We have the public. We have government, lots of government, all the way up to and including the United States Congress and the President. We have Walmart. We have Target. And we have all the shippers in between those who depend on the port of Long Beach for getting their goods to market. We developed an all-hazard business continuity plan that focused on maintaining the land and water infrastructure, 
maintaining a, a safe and secure port environment, and meeting legal, regulatory, and financial requirements. We are a landlord port. And what that means is we don't move trains, we don't move ships, we don't move trucks. We own the property, we lease the land, we support our tenants, like some of you, so that they can do their jobs. So what we looked at as a landlord port is we said, all right, first responders, fire, police, coast guards, custom border protection, they're first responders, they focus on life preservation, they focus on what is causing the incident. Is it fire? Is it a terrorist attack? Is it an earthquake? We're going to look at our business continuity plan from another perspective. We're going to look at what did we lose? What was the effect of that disruption? So we focused our efforts on dealing with what we lost and what we had to recover rather than how we lost it. Because reality is if we lose a main bridge, do we really care how it fell? All we know is we've lost it and we've got to come up with a way around it. So we formed a business continuity plan that deals with a number of things, such as assessing critical port infrastructure assets, assisting our port partners, our tenants, with the assessment of their terminal infrastructure so that we can get the port operational again. Quickly deploying resources to implement predetermined workaround strategies. And by that I mean you, do, you go out into the port and you look at, if that bridge goes down, how can I get around that with trucks? If that box girder bridge falls on that rail line, how can I get around that rail line? How can I clear it up so that I can get commerce flowing again? Then we compile that information regarding critical port infrastructure as well as their various levels of operational uh, readiness and we relay that information to the U.S. Coast Guard MITSU, Marine Transportation System Recovery Unit. Now you heard John refer to that earlier. That's the way that we get information from what we're doing up to the federal level to the Coast Guard. We also relay it up through our city's Emergency Operations Center. One of the biggest things that we faced as a port when we first put together a business continuity plan, and if you've done this in your organizations, you can probably relate. You develop a business continuity plan, it's almost like your IT folks coming up with disaster recovery. They decide they're going to put, they're going to set up their recovery plan so that Outlook, your email system, comes up first. Okay? You may not want that to come up first. You may have an accounting system that you want to come up first. But if you don't coordinate those things, they may recover things that are different than what you as the operational folks need to continue your business. We had the same issue when we developed our plan. We did not want to do it in a vacuum. So we set it up so that we would have information flowing from our port partners through us so we could allocate resources and then on, on up to the MITSRU so we would have a coordinated effort. Organizational structure, you've heard it mentioned many, many times. Business continuity is not emergency response. You may stand up your teams quickly, but essentially, what you're doing is you're recovering your business. And we decided to follow the state emergency management system and the national incident management system so that it integrates with the ICS, the incident command system that was developed by the California Fire Authorities and the national government to, to manage incidents. What it is, it's a management framework. It works very, very well because you can expand it and contract it very, very quickly and it allows you to respond to incidents on the fly. Because as Steve will tell you, the incident you start with is not the one you end up with. So you have to be able to respond to it. So the way we organize is we have a policy group, which is senior management, our legal counsel, our board of harbor commissioners, where it's appropriate, depending on the size of the incident. We have an incident management team, which was also referred to up here, the IMT. We also have recovery teams, and this is where the, this, the organization of a business continuity operation differs from what you normally used to. Normally, a business operates with the chief executive, its executive vice presidents, its directors on down. And the business runs fairly well. But they're not necessarily the, recovery, the, the subject matter experts because they have people who do that for them, like you folks, okay? When you are recovering your business, what you want is a subject matter experts with their boots on the ground recovering your business, and that's what we did. So our recovery teams are our engineers, are our construction people, are our maintenance people, our plumbers who have what we like to call tribal knowledge of exactly where the valves are and how to turn them off. This is what our, our structure looks like. For those of you who are familiar with the incident command system, it is very familiar. 
It has an instant commander, operations, planning, logistics, admin, and finance. It's a little bit different as you get down into the, the various branches and the various teams, but the reason we chose this model is because it integrates seamlessly with other first responders and other organizations. When somebody says to me, you need to go talk to the Long Beach Fire Department's planning section chief, I know exactly what that person's going to do. I know who he is and what he's going to do. And it allows us to have that kind of communication that's very, very vital when you're trying to, re to recover your operation. Some of the responsibilities of our subject matter experts, structural, roadway, rail, navigational waters, sewer and storm system. It's critical that the, the sewage flows one way and the water flows another. Okay, Electrical systems. Uh, folks don't like to work if it's dark outside, and if the cranes don't work, we can't unload anything, so we have to analyze that very, very quickly. Potable water, you have to have something to drink. The other thing that's important that we, that we looked at in terms of our business continuity plan was we have to have communication. Communication is a very critical element to the overall success of a recovery effort. If you're not communicating with up and down your chain of command. If we're not letting our Board of Harbor Commissioners understand what we're doing and how we're doing it, what you end up with is a lot of questions that don't have to get asked if you communicate right the first time. So the way we dealt with it is in the ICS there is a liaison officer and there's a public information officer. And I've described up there their key tasks. Public, the liaison officer is tasked with dealing with our port tenants. And the public information officer is tasked with dealing with providing updates to the media, of which there will be many, and outside agencies. We also have under and working with our public information officer, our governmental affairs unit, which deals with the elected officials all the way up and in, to including the national level. The information we obtain from our port partners are used then to prioritize our land side and water, water side infrastructure recovery. A lot of words. Look at it as a, as a, as a funnel. We get a lot of information from our tenants. This wharf doesn't work. This power doesn't work. That funnels down to us. We allocate resources based on what we're being told. That then gets funneled down to the 22 elements of essential information that the captain of the port is going to want to know to determine whether or not he's going to keep parts of the port open or closed. He's going to be interested in three things. Impacted, not impacted, partially impacted. He wants to know more, he'll ask. So what we do is we take a lot of information, roughly about 40 questions that we ask our tenants, narrow that down, allocate our resources, narrow that down further and provide that information to the captain of the port so that he can effectively manage his side of recovering port operations. Port tenant, you say, how do we do that? Telephone or email, if it works. How many of you during, uh, have been here during an earthquake and tried to call anybody? Raise your hand. Did it work? Probably not. SMS does, so if you want to text, usually the text will, will work. But we decided, I don't think we're going to just use telephones and, and emails. So we have an encrypted radio system that we utilize throughout the port that allows us to communicate with our tenants, as well as Long Beach Fire, as, long, as well as the Coast Guard, and with our other stakeholders in the port. And if all else fails, you get in the car or you put your shoes on, you walk out and you talk to them. Say, how are you doing? What is the status of your operation? This is a quick flow chart. I'm not going to go through it. I've pr pretty much described it to you, but you have the port partners, the port of Long Beach, and then the Mitsuru. It shows how communication flows up and down. Basically, for those of you familiar with ICS, this is called a planning P. Our ongoing objectives are to train all the members of the port's incident management team, to exercise the training that we provided them, and to continue port partner outreach. Future goals we need to have an electrical survey done of our port. It may surprise you, but our port's been around 101 years and we just don't happen to have accurate plans of every electrical wire in the port. I know that's shocking. I, I don't let it really frighten you, but we just don't. I'm not sure they could draw things back when our port was first built. The point is, we need to know where the wires are, what they power, and how to power them when our electrical provider says, you know what? We'd like to help, but we just had a, a 7.9 earthquake on the San Andreas Fault that lasted 100 seconds, and all of the power lines coming down through the Cajon Pass have been severed, and you don't have power for 30 days. And that is the scenario that Southern California Edison has painted for us. 
So we are doing an electrical survey to determine how can we get around that? How can we isolate the Edison feed on one side and develop ways to power our cranes and our lights and our pumps another way so that we can still move freight and move emergency supplies? Future goal is to assist our port partners with identifying their risks and impacts to their business. We can't move freight. They do that. So we want to help them develop business continuity plans so that they can also participate and be able to function after a disaster occurs. And finally, I want to leave you with this one takeaway. It's been said that business continuity is a project, that you assign it to somebody, they go and they put a binder to get together, they put it on a shelf. Well, I differ with that. I say business continuity is a process. It's not a project. And we consider it a vital project and one that the world's events lately make even more vital. And it's something that we've considered, that we're trying to make better, and we would urge you to do the same in your organizations because together we can be more resilient and then things like earthquakes and other man and natural disasters just become a blip on our radar rather than a business ending event. Thank you very much. So that includes, uh, concludes our, uh, our panelist uh, remarks and uh, standing by for any questions. Yes. Wait, right now. Hi, my name is Todd Lacoste. I'm with Caltrans. Um, you had a, um, the gentleman from the, um, the Coast Guard, or no, the Long Beach Fire Department. You had a bunch of um, organizations and that were, looked like they were designed for emergency response. Um, do you have the contacts of those organizations anywhere in a table or a matrix that would be available to, uh, or maybe the Office, or maybe of, the emergency office of Emergency Services, has, services them? has them? Do you know, do you know? In several, 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 several plans we have those contacts, um, also with been lucky to work with Caltrans as far as our uh, port recovery, our MTS recovery, and work with the local folks around around uh, Terminal Island there. But it, as far as you're asking the contacts for all those uh, different public agencies, the emergency responders, just from the different plans that we have from the Area Maritime Security Plan to the, the Area Contingency Plan. Yeah, I'd be looking for like a very high level, you know, two or three or five pages of contact information, sort of what organization, what their function is, and their, and their name and phone number or whatever. You don't have anything like that? Uh, it's it's basically spread out through several different plans. Kelly does have a list of all the primary and secondary agencies <coughs> in the state with their contacts as well. Yeah. That's Thank you. the state emergency plan. Yeah, we can, I mean, we can take the card <coughs> afterwards and, uh, and, and work to get the specific information that you need. Any other questions? How do you have a governance program in an emergency? Do you have a quorum and so forth? So emergency powers are very, very critical. And in my experience, I've seen very little of that in public agencies where they have thought out uh, the, the requirements associated with running the incident during the actual incident if you don't get a quorum or you don't have the executives there to manage those incidences. And I was wondering how Rich has dealt with that in the Port of Long Beach. There's a couple of ways what Cosmo is referring to is a, a couple of issues. One is the Brown Act, which requires that any public agency, if, if there is a majority of the elected body or appointed body meeting, it has to be done in public. And sometimes that's not possible following a disaster. So you have that one issue. The other issue is how do you get authority granted under things like the California Contracting Code, which requires a certain methodology be used when contracts are let by public agencies. To respond to that, we've had conversation with our city attorney's office who has told us that there are ways that we can circumvent the Brown Act using telephones, radios, so that we don't have to have it in public. They're, they will support that. The California contract code is exempted in a disaster. However, FEMA does require after 70 
roughly 70 hours that you do use contracts for uh, recovery work because of incidents they, that occurred during Katrina. And we have contracts that we've already drawn up with uh, providers that are working in the port or that would come to the port. And we already have those in place. So to address your point prime specifically, there's only, there are certain things that we can go around and what we would probably do to give you a good example, if we needed Board of Harbor Commissioner authority to let a, a large contract for a business continuity contract, we would have, we would contact them using secure radios, have a meeting, and have them vote on up or down without putting them together. Have you gotten past that? And only by experience, have you gotten past that? What happens when you can't get three and you only have two out of the five? What we've talked about is the idea that our executive director would be given that authority under certain pre-designated conditions to let contracts. In public entities, you have situations where uh, the executive director, say, of the Harbor Department is only allowed to execute a contract up to a certain amount of money without having uh, the governing body, in our case, the Board of Harbor Commissioners, provide authority to do that. We have talked to the city attorney's office about drafting a resolution that the board would give the executive director that authority with certain, under certain predetermined conditions such as a declared emergency or declared disaster. Great job, Rich. Uh, answering questions from the previous uh, uh, security director from the port. I'm not sure that's really <laughs> fair there, but. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions? All right, on behalf of all the panel members, thank you very much for your time today.